WCON 1170 Radio and Cable Channel 16 are pleased to present We Should Know, hosted by J.W. Simmons, an upbeat, informative look at people, places, and issues facing our community. This education-based analysis of issues will remain positive and informative as we consider closely what we should know. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We should know is on there. I want to thank you for being with us today. I'm J.W. Simmons, your host. We're talking about planting today. We're talking about things that you might want to put in the ground as spring is here. And some folks may say summer is already here as we've had some 80 plus degree days uh, in the past week or so. And uh, we're talking to somebody that literally has been on the show before that folks know and uh, Brad Hardison with Corpus Extension. Sometimes when I have you on, I think maybe it'd be better if you did my introduction because folks know you uh, in a lot of places more than they know me. You started in 2016 Corpus Extension here in this county. You you kind of came in with a plant background, row crop background. Uh, livestock was also in your portfolio. Grew up in the Midway area. Uh, you got your undergraduate degree, your master's degree. Um, you've got the academic credentials plus the experiential credentials to talk about everything related that that we, we could touch on today. Uh, and I, I appreciate you being here and sitting down and talking to us about some things. But it's the time of the year that folks look at doing things in their yard. In fact, they may want to go out and trim shrubbery. They may want to go out and plant some blueberry bushes. They may get real excited about something that's crawling in their yard or boring under the ground and not know it. We want to cover all that today. But first, let me thank you for taking time to sit down and talk to us. Well, I appreciate being here today, J.W., and being able to talk to your audience. Well, let's uh, <clears throat> let's start out with a little of, of looking at what some of the things that maybe is that you see coming into corpus extension because you've got a lot of quote experts out there in in offices and that most of them are empty because they're out in the field talking to people what do you see coming in this time of the year when we start looking at spring when vegetation starts coming out what are some of the problematic things that you get calls on well you know that at this time of the year you don't know if it's summer spring or winter right on you know, it's 70 degrees, 80 degrees today. It, we're forecast to be colder tomorrow and over the weekend. Uh, and a lot of people get the itch to want to plant something when it gets warm. Matter of fact, a lot of people here in Sepsis County do. The phone starts ringing off the hook all the time. You know, is it time to spray my lawn? Uh, what do I need to do about these weeds in my lawn? Can, is it, can I plant my shrubbery now? Is it too late to prune? What do I need to do with my fruit trees? Um, and then farmers start calling in about production meetings. You know, we have our production meetings this time of the year. Mm -hmm. When is production meetings? When can I get some pesticide credits? Mm -hmm. um, when are you having a pesticide training class? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really the gamut of everything going on in ag. You know, everybody's uh, kind of like plants. You kind of go dormant during the winter and take some time off. Mm -hmm. And then when it gets spring again, everybody's just raring to go. I think everybody wants to kind of, whether you'd like you just pointed out, whether you're kind of a hobbyist gardener or whether you're a big farmer, you want to kind of get ahead of the game. What What is happening that you're seeing with climate change that that ag and farmers and folks that are, are interested in planting are having to adjust to? Is is there some cycle of events now that is, you just mentioned the, the weather as far as heat and so forth, but we also dealing with drought, water issues. That, what are we looking at? And it, is there some kind of formula or something uh, that they can look at to say, wait a minute, we might better not do that now? Well, you know, I wish I could see what the future was going to be with the weather. Um, and, and it's hard to predict what the weather's going to do. I was just reading a report from the climate office uh, this morning, mm -hmm. and it was talking about our spring may be 20 days early this year. Uh, that's one thing they're forecasting out of the climate office. Uh, we see it with the warm weather that we're having right now. Uh, but the thing that we can look at is our past data. Mm -hmm. You know, what has changed in our in, in the past, you know, 15 or 20 years that's mm -hmm. affecting us now. Uh, I think that gives us a good gauge on what, what we can do going forward. And when we look at um, things that's changed in the past 10 or 15 years, rainfall is a big thing that's changed. Um, you know, we normally average 49 or 50 inches a year. 
the past five or six years, it has been upwards of 60 inches uh, or more. And then you go into last year and we have a drought during the summer. Uh, we still met our minimum rainfall amounts, our average rainfall amounts. Um, but rainfall is a big thing, you know, especially in the fall of the year, if you get a storm coming in here that dumps 10 or 15 inches of rain on us, you can't get your crops out of the field. You can't even get in your yard and mow the grass. Mm -hmm. um, it's so bad. And then another thing is uh, our frost dates. And a lot of people don't think about our frost dates, first and last frost dates. Um, our average here in Sampson County for our first frost date in the fall is uh, November 3rd. Um, our last frost date, which is going to be in the spring average, is March 30th. Um, when we look back at the last couple of years, uh, we've had killing frost in May. So if you get out early uh, and plant your, your vegetable garden, or if you plant spring plants early, or if you're even a farmer and you're trying to get your crop in early so you can have an earlier harvest to avoid those rains, then that killing frost comes in in May and then you've got to turn around and replant everything. So it's um, it's it's really hard to forecast what's happening, um, but but climate is changing and everybody's got to deal with it. How, how does farmers and, and what advice do, do you give? And, and I'm sure they go through this and they're like all of us now, they read stuff everywhere, but what, what advice do you get to find that, that kind of perfect time? Because as you just pointed out, it could be two to 10 days or 20 days difference, and everybody needs to try to do what they can to get ahead of that curve. That's right, and it's a guessing game, really. I mean, you look at extended forecast, you look at the information coming out of the climate office, you look at what happened last year, and, and then it's an educated guess. You take all the information you can get and uh, make that educated guess. A lot of people want to try to be early. Um, you know, if you're early getting planted, you're early harvesting, you get your maximum uh, revenue out of that, your maximum profit. Because the first blueberries that hit the market are going to be the most expensive. Um, you know, the first watermelons that come out of the field are going to be the most expensive. Uh, so everybody wants to have that early harvest so they can maximize their uh, profits on what they're growing. And um, sometimes it works. And then sometimes, you know, you kind of get bit by the old weather bug and you have to start over um, because of these late frosts that we've been having. Mother Nature has an impact one way or the other and, and always has. And, and now we just see it more critical. That's right. So, so when we, we're thinking about the, the whole farming process and some of the uh, kinds of crops that are grown, is, is the vegetable crops more, uh, I guess, in Sampson County, I, th I think of everything from pepper to cucumbers, uh, even carrots. But what are some of the bigger crops that, that we look at for exports? I know we've got sweet potatoes out there, but kind of give us uh, an idea of, of what goes out of this area, this part of the state. As far as that goes, eastern North Carolina, what goes out of the state and what's some of our biggest export crops? Well, you know, some of the biggest crops that we have is um, blueberries, uh, watermelons. We're number one, Sampson County's number one in, in the state. Uh, for blueberries, for water, for all types of melons, not just watermelons, cantaloupes, honeydews, uh, and some of the newer melons coming out. Uh, also, nut production. You wouldn't think it, uh, but we also are one of the leading counties in uh, pecan production. So we produce a lot of pecans. Uh, we also produce a lot of soybeans um, and corn that go out of here. Uh, peanuts, we're growing in peanuts. You know, we're one of the top 10 counties in peanuts. Those are some of our biggest commodities that we grow out here. But it, you're right, we grow everything from asparagus to zinnias mm -hmm. and everything in between. We have small people, uh, small producers that's growing cut flowers. Uh, we have small producers that are growing vegetables um, and then our larger commodities. So uh, anything you can think of, we're the most diverse agriculture county. Uh, probably in the United States uh, with everything that we grow here. Well, we've got certainly got the land mass. I mean, you're talking a county that's uh, uh, debatably the largest county in the state as far as geographical size, 72 miles from one end to the other. The, does the, the climate issue on the size of the county have an impact? For example, if I was going to grow a certain crop, it would it'd be better off in the southern end of the county versus the northern end of the county. Is it is it coming to that? 
at this point in time? Well, uh, it's interesting you ask that because, <laughs> you know, when we do our uh, official variety trials for NC State, um, typically we have to have growers that meet the requirements to uh, plant those variety trials. Mm -hmm. Uh, most of those has been in and around Clinton, um, but last year we actually worked with some growers in the northern end of the county and in the southern end of the county. Um, and it was really interesting to see the difference in rainfall last year. Uh, you could take a swath of land that was kind of through, uh, followed 24 through the county from Roseboro right on into Clinton, right out of Clinton toward Warsaw, that didn't get the rain that other parts of the areas did. And and the yield uh, w was just so much different, uh, so much more yield in those areas that got the rain. Um, so so when you think of a, uh, a county that's as big as Rhode Island, we're mm -hmm. big, big mm -hmm. as Rhode Island, um, a, a lot of, of climate and rainfall and heat differs uh, from one end to the other. Um, when you look at the county, most of our vegetable crops are grown on the eastern side, more toward Duplin. Mm -hmm. um, so um, then you got to consider the soils, how many different soils that we have here and which is best for what's growing. Um, a, a lot of factors to consider when you're, when you're almost a thousand square miles in Sampson County. And, and that that adds up to decision making for for all of those farmers out there that are that are in this. Not only uh, did they uh, obviously enjoy what they're doing, as mom's been doing it for many many years, but it's a decision making process. Where do I, if I'm renting land, where is the best land to rent if I decide to, to have a new crop? Uh, what is the soil type? What does that mean? What's the uh, what's the availability of getting that tested? How often do I test it? Does the soil type change? I want to kind of get into some of those things in this second segment as we as we take a break here. But uh, I want to come back when we do touch on that and then kind of move to some of the more, um, should I say, aggressive things that the average person is going to be doing in their yard. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back in a moment. We're going to be talking about some things that you might need to know about your yard or your personal garden. We're talking with Brad Hartz. We'll be back in a moment. Providing fewer commutes, more backyard offices, and crystal clear meetings. Providing less, uh, you froze up. And more presence in your presentations. Providing a better internet experience. Providing possible. You're out for an evening on the town. Finally a chance to relax and forget that you left your front door completely unlocked. Fortunately, you just installed a security system from Star Communications. With just your cell phone, you can check on your house, lock it down, light it up, and get back to relaxing. He forgot to put Buster in his crate. Unfortunately, we can't help with that. Security and automation from Star Communications. Call today to find out more. Most aging adults want to stay in their homes as long as possible. And as your loved ones get older, you want to support them, even when you can't be there. Star is proud to offer Star Alert. This new system is now mobile and has GPS compatibility, so your loved ones can live their lives and you can have peace of mind, knowing they can get the help they need with just the simple push of a button. The new Star Alert also offers automatic fall detection, so help will be alerted even if they can't press the button. Call and ask about Star Alert today. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We're talking with Brad Hardison. He is the Director of Corporate Extension here in this county, in Sampson County, for folks that listens from Bladen, Duplin, Johnson, and other counties. That you've got a, a person similar to this and in a role to do the same thing with Corporate Extension. But Brad, I want to thank you for being with us today. A lot of the topics that we're talking about mm -hmm. it is in the first segment we covered uh, a, a big overview of a lot of issues and one of the key issues that you mentioned i wanted to pick up on for folks that are looking at their particular uh environment on a smaller basis not maybe the large farms but on a smaller basis and they're thinking i need to change my shrubs out or i need to plant a flowery bush or what have you they'll go to or they'll start seeing in the next i suspect in the next week probably already have a lot of these nurseries opening of course some of our major box stores has got all kinds of plants out there mm -hmm. they say oh this this plant is it looks real good pick it up stick it in the yard and in two or three weeks it ain't doing well 
Is that soil type? Is that environment or what? Where was the mistake there? Well, it could be a whole lot of things that, that cause that problem. Uh, soil type is one. Uh, soil nutrient load could mm -hmm. be another one. pH. Um, it could also be, is that plant in the right place? Uh, you know, some plants like uh, dry feet, some plants like wet feet, wet areas or dry areas. Um, and, you know, a lot of that's not found on the plant tag. Um, that's where you've got to know what you're buying uh, and where it should go. We got a great website for that, Plants NCSU. Uh, you can Google that and, and find that plant website and um, find those plants. And you're right, everybody's starting to open up. People's calling, is it time to plant yet? Can I start planting? And um, a big thing I can tell people before you decide to buy a plant, because a lot of people walk by something and it'll be beautiful sitting there in the store. Mm -hmm. And they impulse buy, they want to buy it. They said, oh, that'll look lovely in my yard. Yeah. And then find out it's not the right plant for your yard or or it's not going to grow well in the environment that you're going to place it in. Uh, or you may plant it too deep. You know, that's mm -hmm. a big problem that mm -hmm. we find in some of them. Um, but before people buy plants and go out and and start shopping for plants, I would suggest and recommend that they do a soil sample uh, to find out what the pH is in that mm -hmm. area uh, and also what the nutrient load is mm -hmm. in that area. Um, because soil is kind of like bacon. You need a recipe mm -hmm. uh, to be successful. And, and it works the same way uh, with soil and plants. Plants require a certain pH and plants require certain nutrients uh, to be healthy. And um, if you can put the right plant in the right place, uh, then, then you're way ahead of the game. And if you get your soil sample right and that plant can absorb those nutrients, uh, it'll be healthy and can, and can um, uh, ward off pests that's going to come in the future. So, so basically what I hear you saying is like the soil type for uh, roses, for example, might be different than the soil type for tulips or something like that if you're planting flowery plants. Right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And one big one mm -hmm. is azaleas. Um, azalea is like a, an acidic soil, which is a low pH. If you plant azaleas in a soil that's going to be, you know, close to neutral, they're not going to do well at all because it, it affects their ability to absorb the nutrients uh, that they need to grow and, and be healthy. To, to kind of help draw a picture to that, it, when, when we think about acidic soil, uh, it, are we talking drier, more sandy soil, or are we talking darker, wetter soil? Well, uh, or can it, it be either one? It, it can be either one. And our soils in Saps County typically is going to be acidic. They're mm -hmm. going to be lower on pH. And that comes from uh, our parent material of our soils. You know, it's marine sediments. It's our parent material mm -hmm. here. It's going to be more acidic. So that's why a lot of people uh, have to add lime to their soil to bring the pH up. Um, however, it depends on what plant you're planting. Blueberries, azaleas, those are two I can think of right off my head, like more acidic soil, and they're going to do better in that acidic soil. So you don't really want to lime those areas to bring the pH up. When we when you talk about sample the soil, is that something relatively easy? Does somebody have to come out and do that? Is that do they get a scoop and get something put it in a bag and take it somewhere? How does that work? Well, you know, soil sampling um, is fairly easy for somebody that does it all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't go out and sample homeowners loans. Uh, that's something that's just not in our budget to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but soil sampling is really easy. All you need is a little hand shovel, and you go out there in your yard and you take your hand shovel and you take 15 random samples of the specific area you want to plant the plants. Mm -hmm. um, if you're looking at a flower garden, you just want to take it in that area of the flower garden. If you're doing your lawn, you just want to go out and take those samples from your lawn. How deep do you want to get? And that's a great question because with the lawn, you want to stay in the root zone of whatever plant it is you're planting. So if you're in your lawn, uh, you want to go about four to six inches deep. That's going to be as deep as your roots are in your lawn. If you're doing it in a, your shrubbery, 
uh, your shrubs are going to be a little deeper at those roots, so you're going to go about six to eight inches. If you're planting fruit trees, you want to go down to at least 16 inches because those roots are really going to get down in the ground. And uh, we have free soil sample test kits at our office. It comes with the boxes and it comes with instructions on how do you take your soil sample. So all you got to do is come by our office, pick up a soil sample test kit, and uh, it tells you how to walk you through step one, two, three, four, five. Uh, fill the uh, box up with your sample, your soil sample, and then you can bring it back to our office and we'll transport it to Raleigh for you. And right now you can get your results back in about two weeks. That's, that's a pretty good deal considering that a lot of folks may be thinking that uh, I don't have, number one, I don't have the cash right on me to start sample, doing all these samples. But the important thing is that you will do that and it takes a little time, but now's the time to do it. I mean, you can't wait till you get the plant sitting there in a bucket and then decide to do my soil sample because it might have to sit there two weeks for you. And it probably gets longer as the season goes on. That's right. You know, in, in the fall of the year, it's when a lot of farmers are taking their samples. And as a matter of fact, last week, they were just doing uh, samples that the lab received before Christmas. Uh, so, you know, they're eight, nine weeks behind during the heavy part of the season. This time of the year now, they're starting to get those down and we're on a two-week wait period. Well, and I, I think the the conversation we're having is important because I'm reflecting back over a few years and a big concern folks have mentioned to me is that the cost of plants, especially if you're talking about woody plants or even uh, blueberries or what have you, th these plants have gotten expensive when you go to buy three or four or what have you, you know, I mean, you you can you can spend two or three hundred dollars and in no time, as you pointed out, saying that's a nice looking plant. I believe I'll get that. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's there's a lot that goes into plants now. You're not just getting the pot and you're not just getting the soil that goes in the pot and the fertilizer and the plant that goes in the plot in, in the pot. There is a lot of breeding programs now for these plants that's trying to um, work on these plants to become more drought tolerant. Um, need less fertilization, um, is pest resistant to some pest. And you know, it takes some of these companies years, uh, up to 10 years of research um, to find how these plants can be um, more drought resistant and more pest resistant. And then you've actually got to pay for that on the back end. When we talk about, think about landscaping and, and those kinds of things, I've I've had a conversation with folks and they said, well, I've decided I'm going to pull up all the shrubbery around my house because 20 or 30 years ago when I planted it, I planted it too close to the to the house. Is, is that something that has changed where we now are saying your shrubbery needs to come further from your house? Uh, just kind of talk to us about the planting of the shrubbery. If we decide to pull those up, is that a good thing or should we just cut them back? Well, you, you could do either one. Uh, this goes back to having the right plant at the right place. Mm -hmm. You know, when you buy a plant at one of your local garden centers, you're going to buy it in a two or three gallon pot. It's not going to be that big. And you need to think about how big is that plant going to be when it's mature? Mm -hmm. I've seen rhododendrons planted beside people's houses as a foundation planted that when they planted it starts out as being about as big as one of these chairs. Mm -hmm. Five years later, it's big as the side of the house. Wow. And that's because you put it um, in the right place as far as soil and sunlight and water. Uh, or rainfall, and then you don't think about mature size and it just grows and, and it likes where it is and just grows and overtakes your house. Uh, so really when you're buying plants, uh, especially foundation plants, you really need to think about the mature size of those plants five years down the road. A great example is uh, the Leland Cypress. Everybody used to plant Leland Cypresses, mm -hmm. you know, on their property lines. Mm -hmm. And when you buy a Leland Cypress, it's five feet tall and you plant it four feet apart mm -hmm. when they should be 10 feet apart. Mm -hmm. If you plant them 10 to 12 feet apart, you know, it looks like you don't have anything out there right. when you plant them. Um, but 10 years later, um, they're grown together like they're supposed to be uh, if you plant them to the right space and apart. And some of those plants that you mentioned that, that I've watched literally over the years on property lines, like maybe down the side of somebody's yard or what have you, some of those plants have a disease thing where they'll I'll see them after five, six years, they'll start dying out. They just literally turn brown and all of a sudden the tree's gone. Yeah, and a big problem with that is the spacing requirement. 
Um, if those trees are planted or any plant, shrub or anything, planted too close, you can't get airflow in there. Once it gets wet, then it stays wet. When you have wet and the plant and then disease present, that's the disease triangle, uh, then you have problems. So if you space them out far enough, uh, or as recommended spacing is, then you can get that airflow through there, dry those plants out, and you don't have near the, the disease problems that you do if they're too close. We're, we're going to take, we're coming up on a break here, and I want to uh, kind of, for this next segment, get into some of the pest that it, that we're seeing and, and how do we kind of ward that off. And, and I'm talking here to just kind of get folks to know where we're going here is everything from fire ants to things that kill the berries or call the, if you got blueberries or strawberries or whatever you might have, or even roses, what should we put on them? Uh, is there things that's toxic that we need to understand if we get it on our hands, we need to make sure we, we wash our hands good. Most folks are familiar with something called seven dust. You know, <laughs> seemed like that was a cure all for everything. But I want to get into that and maybe talk about some voles and moles as well. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back in a moment. We're talking with Brad Hardison about all things plants at this time of the year. Stay tuned. Call a friend. To get the most out of your electronic devices, you need a strong internet connection and a protected home Wi-Fi network. You need high-speed internet from Star. Star has the fastest, most affordable high-speed internet service available for all your devices. We have no long-term contracts or high-pressure sales. Our service speaks for itself, and switching is hassle-free. We take care of everything with free installation from a local company. High-speed internet from Star. Internet at the speed of light. Just because something may work doesn't mean it's right for your business. Let Star Communications knowledgeable consultants help you customize a hosted voice system that's right for you. Our dedicated experts work with you to understand your business needs and guide you at every step from choosing and installing services to ongoing maintenance and support. Contact Star today. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We should know who's on there. My name is J.W. Simmons. I'm your host. We're talking about all things plants. And a lot of that comes with consideration of all things that are insects and pests to include many different things that Brad's going to address in this segment. So uh, dial your radio in if you're driving, if you're on the track, or turn it up a little bit. But if you're sitting at home, call a friend because we're going to talk about things that uh, probably you might not have considered that's impacting your loan. Latest, uh, latest information that I've I've read that, that's out there is there's so many pests that's hitting plants that is new to the area that they've transcended or coming in. And I know the ag department looks at stuff that's being imported into the country. Mm -hmm. What are we seeing in that area now that we need to be aware of, um, particularly if, it, if it's affecting certain kinds of plants that we're going to invest in? You know, we talked about uh, in the, I think, first or second segment here, we talked about the amount of money. You can invest a lot of money in plants. Yeah, a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And then watch it all go down the drain in just a month. <laughs> and not know what's happening. Uh, talking about pests, there's a lot of different pests and a lot of different categories of pests. If you want to talk about um, insects, mm -hmm. um, one mm -hmm. of the newest coming up is spotted lanternfly. Uh, that's a pest that's coming down from Pennsylvania. Uh, it was actually found in North Carolina this year up in the Triad area. And uh, we got a great publication about it uh, on our website uh, that you can uh, go to our website and, and look at that publication on Spotted Lanternfly. Um, but that is a pest of grapes. And what that uh, Spotted Lanternfly will do, it is a leaf hopper. He's not going to be that big. Real brilliant color, a beautiful looking, if you want to say insect can be beautiful, mm -hmm. uh, just with the color pattern, uh, really beautiful. Uh, but he can destroy grapes. Um, in just a short amount of time, one season can can infest grapes and and does destroy. it kill the vine or just kill, the fruit? Kills the absolute vine, and and that's wow. something we're worried about with our grape industry here, uh, in Sampson County and in the mountains. Mm -hmm. um, 
So that's something we've got our eye on. There's actually a website, I can't remember uh, what it is, but you can report uh, to the NCDA if you actually see one of these spotter and landing flies, and then they'll come down and we'll do a big investigation and find out where it is. How should it we capture from. it? To, I mean, if you see one, should we capture and put it in the old jar, so to speak? Absolutely, and bring it to the extension office so we can get positive verification and identification on it, uh, and then we'll go from there. And there's over the years I've noticed with these insects and different kinds that are moving throughout the country that, that there's an effort to try to eradicate it. Is is that really possible? Can we eradicate certain kind, or is that just us trying to hold it down? Well, you know, it depends on what type of insect we're trying to eradicate. Um, Department of Agriculture did a great job with the boll weevil. You know, in mm-hmm. the 1970s, people couldn't grow cotton in our area because of the boll weevil mm-hmm. just destroyed it. Um, They were able to implement a program, and basically, I don't even remember the last time anyone has seen a boll weevil in North Carolina. It has definitely been a long time. Uh, The the thing about that pest is it is going to be in cotton fields. Hmm. Uh, So you can actually target what they're feeding on Mm -hmm. and their life cycle in the cotton field. Now, if you talk about a fire ant, you're talking about a whole different level of pest because fire ants are everywhere. They're in your yard, my yard, roadsides, fields, forest, anywhere that they can build a nest. Where did these fire ants come from? And and I, I asked that question uh, for, for this reason. At growing up, as you did on a farm, I don't recall seeing a lot of fire ants. That was not a big issue. And all of a sudden, I've seen more and heard more conversation about it over the past few years. Yeah, well, fire ants came into the United States in Louisiana in the 40s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they came from South America, and they were brought in on some landscape material, as a matter of fact. Hmm. And then they started moving out uh, across Louisiana and Texas and Alabama. And the first ones was found here in Wake County um, in the 50s. And they was in landscape pots. And they were able to eradicate those in the landscape pots Mm -hmm. before they got out. Uh, Then they were found shortly after that in Wilmington. um, And they were able to eradicate those. Then they found a colony in Brunswick County in the 50s that was located on the roadside, and they had already spread. Wow. So that's that's how, <laughs> and from Brunswick County, that's how they've spread. They're almost in every county in North Carolina now, even up to the mountains. At one time, uh, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, they said they would never spread out of the southeast. They wouldn't mm-hmm. get as far as North Carolina mm-hmm. because the climate was so cold. Um, but fire ants has evolved and they've moved and they've been able to take some of these winters. And um, it's we don't even talk about control of fire ants, we talk about managing fire ants now because it's, it's something you have to do at least two or three times a year uh, to manage your fire ants. So if, if a person's thinking, well, I've, I've discovered uh, a couple of, of hills of fire ants and I really, I really need to get rid of them, they can forget totally dismissing them from their property. They're always going to be, you can, like you said, you can hold it down, but in next year, look out, there's going to be two or three more hills there. That, that's right, always. And, and the problem with fire ants is, is that if you actually control and clean your yard of fire ants now, if your neighbors aren't doing it, if they're, uh, if fire ants are still uh, active in fields or forest near, near your house, you're going to have them. And near to your house is up to 12 miles. That's how far these queens can fly. Uh, and once a queen lands, then she's going to build a colony wherever she lands at. That's, a, that's amazing. I, and I, I think not only from the sense of understanding what fire ants is, but the resilience of fire ants. I, that's, that is a, a story that should be, t- I, can, I can see scientists looking at that and figuring out, well, maybe we need to do whatever they're doing to be able to res- have a resilient population. You know? Yeah, I mean, you know, during Florence, when we had the floods yeah. uh, here in the county, you know, we watched balls of fire ants just float on top of the water. Uh, until they could find some dry land, and then they all got off, build a new mound where they got off at, and survived through the floods. Um, that's how they did it. Um, but control, like we talk about, or management instead of control, 
is is really a difficult thing to do. There's a couple of times in the year you need to do it. We've got a great fact sheet at the extension office. It's got a decision tree mm -hmm. on how many fire ants you got, if you got a lot, if you got a few, uh, how to treat them. Uh, you can use the two-step method, which is some of these products mm -hmm. we have on the uh, table here. One problem we have with uh, fire ants is misapplication of some of the uh, treatments that we have. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a lot of people go to the store and they buy the fire ant bait, and that is a great thing to buy to use. It actually works. It takes 7 to 14 days for the bait to work. Uh, one of the misapplications, people pour the bait right on top of the mound. Um, when fire ants go out looking for food, they're going to leave the mound and go out um, as far as they need to go. So you need to place that bait at least two to four feet away from the mound. Up to four feet? Up to four feet away from the mound. Uh, that bait has an attractant, the attractant soybean oil. That's one thing fire ants love to eat. Uh, so they will pick that bait up, they'll carry it back to the mound and feed it to the queen or queens. And once those queens die, then the mound will die. Uh, a lot of people, you, you know, it's funny. They go out there and they kick the mound and yeah. tear it up and get all the fire ants riled up and then pour the bait on it. Yeah, or pour some of that powder yeah, on it. Or the powder. And if you think about it, if if you or me, if we have a tornado come through and it tears our house down, I'm not going to look at you and say, hey, where do you want to go eat, JW? That's you know right, I mean? exactly. You know? And the fire ants are going to be the same way. Yeah. You know, once you tear their mound down, they're going to be interested in building that mound back up, not on going out there and finding food. So really, you need to use the bait uh, to begin with, treat those individual mounds. Um, if you have a persistent mound, then you can go to the mound drenches. Uh, put those powders on top of the mound, and they need watering in. That's something a lot of people don't do, is water that mound in, because that toxicant needs to get all the way down in that mound to where the queen is. This this process is something that's it's really important for folks to, uh, for us to spend a little bit of time on, because if you don't do it that way, you're going to be basically killing a few fire ants at the top of the ground, and you're not going to get the, the nest of the fire That's right. Absolutely And correct. you're going to have to do that over and over again. You're still not going to go in. That's right. And if you apply correctly, uh, you can manage them at least until the next uh, breeding cycle comes So around. basically, you got to do the, the three to four feet out, two to four feet out, do that, and then if you put the, the dust or powder on it, uh, that'll work and maybe get them off the top of the ground, but the other will be working as well. That's right, and uh, like I said again, uh, we've got a great fact sheet at our office. All you got to do is call us. We can email it to you, or you can pick one up. Can you go online and pull that fact sheet? Um, I can make it where that can happen. Yeah, that, I think that would be easy for folks because they might say, well, I don't have time to run by, but they can take their phone or their computer and just pull it up, and that way they'll see it. There's a process to it. That's right. Not only using the right material, but, but applying it in the correct way. I, th there's so many things here, and I want you to touch on some of these uh, uh, different chemicals. Uh, and we've had off air some discussion about how confused you can get, especially if you walk in any one of the suppliers around, whether it's Walmart or whether it's one of our local folks, uh, uh, Big Blue or what have you, uh, to pick up something. That's going to be an issue, and we've got a the segment coming up. I want to kind of get into that. The other thing that um, I think is important for us to know that there's certain rodents that are that are not considered maybe insects, but it's amazing what they can do and how they can decimate uh, not only flowering plants but uh, plants that have roots in them. And I'm told that these rodents come in two varieties. They both of them crawl underground, but one uh, eats off of um, worms and other things in the ground, and the other just is kind. Of, they're kind of vegetarian. So when we come back, I want to touch on. Voles and moles, and, and help us understand how do we eradicate them, again, because they're under the ground. The other thing I want to do is in this segment is to address some of the chemicals that's out there uh, that maybe we need to be very cautious of, as, as you have pointed out, uh, that know what you're buying and just don't pick up the name brand. So I'm going to use that as kind of a teaser to uh, get folks to tune in on the last segment, because this, this segment could be, probably be the most important one that's, again, you don't want to spend a lot of money. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back in a moment. We're talking about a subject that is so huge that we could be talking for two or three weeks about, but it's things that you need to know you can save some money. It's about growing your plants and your trees. We'll be back in a moment. 
Experiencing slow internet? If you have a fast internet package, the problem is most likely your wireless router. With more devices using Wi-Fi, your wireless router may not be able to deliver the speed and coverage you need. We now have the leading solution to enhance your internet experience. Using small devices in a mesh network, these Wi-Fi appliances cover just about any size home so that all your devices can operate to their fullest potential. Whole home Wi-Fi from Star Communications. Get the most out of your internet connection. Eastern North Carolina is a beautiful place where we gladly choose to call home. And we strive to provide the best communication services. STAR is committed to improving communications to all our service areas because we want to improve the communities where we not only work, but also live. STAR Communications, we are neighbors serving neighbors. If you run a business, you need sales. To get sales, you need customers. To get customers, you need exposure. Let our team of experts craft and produce the perfect video ad to reach your intended audience while making the most of your advertising dollars. Call 1-800-706-6538 or visit starcom.net to contact our Star Communications production team and get your business moving to the next level. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. J.W. Simmons here, your host. The name of the show is We Should Know. We're coming to you on Star Communications TV Channel 16 and 316, simulcast on WCLN Radio at 2.30 on Tuesdays, also 7 p.m. Tuesday, Thursdays on Star Communications TV. We're talking with Brad Hardison today. Brad, want to make sure folks understand it. Your role is the director of corporate extension here. There's a lot of parts to corporate extension and uh, we are not able to get into a lot of those parts. We're talking about one segment of one of the things that you've got personal background in because you've been doing it for some years, but now as director, you have purview over all of it. I'm hoping as I open this uh, segment that I can start this thought process. Maybe we can do this kind of as a regular thing rather than maybe once every year or two, uh, just have you come on and, and educate us. Uh, we, we were talking as we went off air, I wanted to come back and continue our conversation about things that impact our plants. Two things that are out there, in fact, I had a person to mention to me some time ago that they literally sold their house because moles had infested their yard, M-O-L-E-S, and then there's another critter that's under the ground that crawls around that's called a vole. Help us understand what that is and, and can we even eradicate them? Well, the thing about moles and voles is you've really got to be on top of them as far as control goes. Or, you know, we talked a while ago about management and control, uh, more of a management issue the same way. Uh, the difference between moles and voles is moles stay under the ground all the time. Mm -hmm. They live in burrows under the ground and they travel through tunnels. Uh, you can think about moles start with the M. They are meat eaters. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're going to eat your, uh, earthworms and grubs and things like that that they find underground. Voles uh, are a whole different other story. Voles is a more of a pine mouse is what they are. Uh, they actually live in burrows under the ground and they will travel mole tunnels and they'll also travel under landscape fabric or, or anything else that's uh, close to the ground that'll give them cover from any predators like cats or hawks or anything that's after them. Well, how do you get rid of these? I mean, is, is there, uh, I know you can buy poisons and those kinds of things. What's the ups and downs of that? Well, there, there is a lot of ups and downs to that. The biggest thing about it is reading the label on what your products are. Uh, the best thing for moles is to use products that have warfarin as the uh, active ingredient. And when we talk about warfarin, you know, you, some people might take that for their heart medication. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's the same thing. Uh, that you're using for the moles. Uh, the moles can't can't process that warfarin and it slowly kills the moles that's out there. And it comes in several different products. Um, you can find it in the peanuts, in the little gummy worm looking things, mm -hmm. or you can find it in an injectable gel. I would recommend the injectable gel because especially if you've got kids in the yard, 
Um, you don't want them walking around and finding a gummy worm laying in yeah. the yard or a gummy peanut that's laying in or the yard. Or dogs or anything else. Yeah, that's right. Because what that mole will do once uh, – they're, they're pretty smart uh, mammals. Uh, once they find that and they start eating it, uh, the next moles that come through will start throwing that out of their tunnels. Um, so a good way to, to find out if you've uh, got moles is look for the tunnels in your yard. Mm -hmm. Once you find the tunnels, you need to find the active tunnels. You can take a, a broomstick, go out in the yard, poke some holes in the tunnel with your broomstick, uh, find out in two days which ones has been repaired. Those are the tunnels that the moles are using. Then you can take that injectable warfarin, squirt it down in the hole, it'll get on the mole, the mole is a very clean animal. They clean their self daily. They'll lick it off and ingest that warfarin. Really? And then once they ingest it, in about seven days, it'll kill them. About like the fire ants. It's a process, really, uh, using the right product, using the right process uh, to manage the moles that you have. It's going to take some time, but, but, but it is possible to get rid of them, no, no matter how bad they are. That's right. And voles is a whole different story. Um, voles, uh, you really need baits for voles, and you can find that in the stores, uh, the vole baits. You need to find out where they are actively feeding. I've actually been in a homeowner's yard before and watched a rose bush get pulled down into a hole by a vole that had chewed it down and was trying to pull the rose bush down in the hole that he was staying in. I and mean, that makes you want to go get the shot then. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm yeah. And you'd be surprised how many homeowners treat them that way too. Yeah. Um, but you know, here's the bad thing about the vole. The vole starts with a V, so it's vegetative. Yeah. It's going to eat your bulbs. It's going to eat your roses, the roots of plants. Plants just start falling over. And this is these are high dollar plants. Absolutely for. high dollar plants. I mean, you know, you can go to somebody's house, the plant will just fall over from where there's no root system, where the vole is eat it off. But the gel don't work for voles. That's right. The gel don't work for voles. You have to get uh, vole bait, find out where the voles are actively feeding, put it out, and then they'll ingest that bait. And then it'll it'll slowly just like with the with the moles, it'll take. Does it come in packets days. or? It does. It comes in packets. Jail it's, form. It's, it's kind of like you find your uh, mouse bait in the packets. Yeah. Very similar to that. But you need to put it in the hole, or can you just sprinkle it on top of the ground? You need to put it on top of the ground near where the voles or, or tunnels are where they're coming in tonight. Because when they come out, they'll see that and maybe eat that That's rather right. than bite the fruit of the plant. That's right. And here's the bad thing about voles: if voles go untreated. A pair of voles can turn into 1,800 voles by the end of the year. Wow. And I thought rabbits could repopulate. <laughs> yeah, voles are really prolific. Um, it doesn't take long. It takes them about six weeks after birth to reach mature age. Uh, and then those start breeding. And then before too long, you've got 1,800 if they go untreated. This is a deep subject. I and mean, We're going to post your number and contact information. But Corpus Extension, they can get up with you. Folks are going to have a lot of questions about this. We can't cover them all here yeah. today. And the great thing is uh, we have a Master Gardener plant clinic. Uh, you know, with my new job duties, I'm really stressed out right now, stretched out. Uh, with budgets, uh, with all the programming that's going on. Administrative stuff. That's right. So our Master Gardeners has a plant clinic. You can call the same number down at the office and, and Master connect Gardeners with them. will be able to answer all these questions for you. You know, they've, they've taken a 40-hour class, 16 weeks. Uh, on all these subjects, they can really get to you a whole lot faster than I can. And you got a wide variety of folks that are now master gardeners in that program that's willing to help you, Include, including, I've just discovered, some former medical doctors <laughs> that's retired and decided to do another approach. So yeah. I, this is a great, great opportunity. So we'll be getting that information out. I want to get back before we run out of time here and talk about some of these products that we got up here and get back to that fire ant thing as well. The application and use you have pointed out clearly is critical. You can spend a lot of money on this, but unless you use it properly, you're basically throwing your money away. Yeah, that's right. You're throwing your money away. You need to know what product you're using first. Then the second thing you need to know is how to apply it correctly. So with products, if, if I was to use a brand name, and you call me and say, uh, Brad, I got a problem with my loan. What do I need to do? And I say, well, go down to the store and, and buy Image. Image will work on it. Well, we can look right here on the table. There's three different Image products, brand name, but they've all got three different active ingredients in it. They're going to treat each one, treat something different. 
So if I had nut grass bad in my yard and went and bought image, I might buy the one with the 2,4-D with the broadleaf weed killer. Mm -hmm. I might buy the one for the pre-emergent that's not even going to touch the nut grass. Then I go out there and spend $50 trying to treat with the wrong product, and I've wasted that money. Or either I think the product's no good and it's not going to work. Um, so don't think about brand names uh, when you're buying products. Think about the active ingredients. Each product on the bottom of the label has the active ingredient. That's what you really need to be looking at when you're buying chemicals or pesticides to treat any pest that we have. And same thing with looking at the fire ants and those kinds of things. Look at it. Look at the application. If they have questions, they can reach out, again, to the Master Gardeners or, or call 592-7161. Yep, that's it. It's correct, 910-592-7161. Mm -hmm. But with with your role now, if if we can get you on air to talk to somebody about some of these things, people can get to the right person. That's right. And as, as director of the program, of course, with Extension, uh, Brad Harris is very, very detailed involved in that leadership role and administrative duties. And I understand that's <laughs> that's a whole other world you stepped into a few it, years ago. It is. It's a whole new world. You know, when you're just looking after one program, it's one thing. You wanted to mention uh, the Bradford Pears. Y yeah, I did want to mention Bradford Pears. You know, coming into work this morning, they're blooming everywhere. Um but Bradford pears is an invasive species. You know, back in the 80s, that's what everybody wanted to plant because they're a symmetrical, nice looking small tree that grows quick in yards. Well, we found out they're not that good. Mm. Uh, they smell bad. Mm. Uh, not only do they smell bad, but they have suckers come up. Birds eat the berries, they go to the edge of the woods. Uh, they plant the berries with their own fertilizer and they're up everywhere and they're actually taking over. Bradford pears don't produce a fruit. Um, and they also don't uh, help pollinate or insects. They're very brittle plants. They are. Uh, Windstorm, uh, rainstorm, you know, hurricanes, they all break, they fall over. Uh, so there is actually a bounty on Bradford pears right now. Wow. So if you take uh, the way that bounty works is if you cut down a Bradford pear tree in your yard and go to one of the bounty uh, Bradford pear bounty days, they will trade you a native tree for those Bradford pears. So all you got to do is take a picture of your Bradford pear in your yard, cut it down, take a picture of it being cut down, then go to one of these events that they're having. You can look that up on Tree Bounty NC uh, or Google Bradford pear bounty. And then you can get a red bud or a dogwood or a different type of native tree that you can replant in its place. That'll work a lot better for their yard. Works a lot better. Uh, Brad, we've covered a lot today, and, and again, I, I know your schedule's tight, but I just want folks to know that they can reach out to Cooperative Extension. We're going to try to put some stuff on the background here so folks can look at it as far as the TV folks, those folks that are listening, 910-592-7161. Uh, um, might not get you, but they, I, they will get somebody to answer that phone, and somebody will get back to them uh, to deal with their problem. That's right. And uh, again, uh, this this is something that's not going to go away. Uh, we've talked about this before, all fair. Uh, we could do a series and, and have you do that, you know, weekly as far as that goes. But I uh, want to welcome you back anytime. Look forward to having you again. Ladies and gentlemen, we've kind of drawn uh, to the curtain closure here. Thank you for being with us. We look forward to seeing you each and every week. And may God bless. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of We Should Know with host J.W. Simmons. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion regarding this or any episode, please send your emails to we should know edu at gmail.com. And remember to tune in every Tuesday at 2.30 for another informative episode of We Should Know.